Hi, uh, so my name is Brian. So uh, thank you guys for all coming to my talk. So uh, one of the things I want to accomplish in this talk is uh, exactly what is the Internet of Things. And there's a lot of articles out, of, out being published, a lot of people taking positions. Kind of means a lot to a lot of people. And I kind of want to talk a little bit about uh, some like connected cities, connected roads, and then actually dive into why Erlang is actually really well suited for building these type of platforms and some of the real challenges. So when you read a lot of these articles, you kind of start to get the sense that there's some pontification going on because they don't really dive down into some of the serious problems and some of these problems remain unsolved. So, so um, as he said, I'm CTO and co-founder of GoFactory. We're an early stage startup. Uh, we've developed a platform for connecting things together. And uh, we have a consumer grade app out on the uh, app store called iTunes for helping connect people together to go do things. But we're also working on some industrial class projects, one with a Fortune 500 company, to cloud connect 15,000 of their uh, 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 fleet trucks, both light, medium, and heavy duty. And then eventually move that into actually cloud connecting assets, everything from uh, heavy equipment to tools. Um, we're also working with another partner to cloud connect uh, wearable sensors, so health and fit, uh, fit sensors, and then as well as looking into uh, working on some early uh, connected city projects. So it's kind of a little bit about who we are. So uh, what exactly is the Internet of Things? Well, so you've heard of it, it's called the industrial internet, machine to machine, and the internet of everything. Um, I tend to like General Electric's uh, industrial internet, but I tend to like their quote a little bit more, which is a convergence of machines, intelligent data to create brilliant machines. So I, that, that, that is really appeals to me. Um, so what exactly is the internet of things? And kind of what's all the hype about? So we kind of like look at the internet of things and we say, well, this is just the internet, right? And it really is, but the problem is, is that by 2020, it's predicted to have over uh, 50 billion things connected to the internet. That's six years from now. So six years, you'll have 50 billion things, eight billion people, one billion sites. That's quite a few things on the internet, considering that the population will only be eight billion. So, so I thought maybe there would be a good place to start, real quick, would be to kind of remind every refresh everybody, and talk about kind of the brief history we all work in the we all work in the industry. We're all very familiar with this, but sometimes it's kind of very eye-opening when you kind of realize the internet has only been around since 1961. So, and that was actually the idea of the internet, right? So, in 1961, there is a paper that was published. Um, the paper was by uh, Lawrence Kleinrock, right? And he was it was called the information flow of large communication networks. So, 1961. To 1968, oops, sorry, 1968 was a bunch of people working on how do they, how do we build the internet, right? Basically, the global connected network. So, uh, in the summer of 1968, there was a network uh, uh, working a group that met with the Stanford Research Institute to discuss several issues relating around hosts communication, hosts communicating with each other. So, 1969, the ARPANET basically arrives. So th this is kind of like the pivotal time and in the history, which is the first network switch. Very first network switch is, is delivered to UCLA. On September 2nd, the very first piece of data moves across that switch. And the, most, uh, the best part was on uh, October 29th, uh, 1969 at 1030, the first, uh, the first internet message was sent um, and it was basically an LO which was for a login, and the system crashed. So that's really kind of interesting to know from an act, uh, like the very first thing that the internet did was crash. <laughs> <laughs> so they then resolved the problem and was able to actually carry out the login. So, so you know, that kind of the harbinger of things to come, I, you know, I think. So I, I kind of wanted to go through the rest of the, the internet. Uh, um, actually, this timeline I want to tell you a little bit about. So this big, tall part up here on the left is the number of connected devices as it correlates to the human population. So obviously in 1961, 
there was zero devices on the internet. Um, by, 19, by the end of 1969 and 1970, there was 334 things on the internet. So that's kind of interesting to take a look at this correlation. So by 1973, TCP is invented as well as the Ethernet. And then these are very pivotal as we start to look at how the Internet of Things is going to go forward in the future. Um, 1974, we see the uh, first commercial version of ARPANET, which is Telenet. And it's considered the first Internet service provider, 1974. Uh, 1978, TCP splits into TCP IP, and then also you see the birth of UDP. And this is, this is specifically to support real-time traffic. So again, 1978, not very far into our, our past. 1991 is actually a very pivotal point where the World Wide Web is, is brought, to, uh, is made public. And this is today what most people view as the internet. Basically, it's the World Wide Web. It's the web of things. It's pages and links and things I can read, right? So what's interesting is, is that in 2014, there's a, I'll actually jump ahead a little bit, there's a pivotal point, which is uh, this year alone, 61.5% of the internet traffic was non-human. So we have non-human bots reading more of the internet than humans are. So that's another interesting milestone. Let's go back. So 1997, 802.11 shows up. Another key piece of technology as we start to look at the Internet of Things moving forward. Um, by 1991, um, so by 1991, there are 225,000 things on the Internet. Not very many. So you can then start to see by 1998, the number of things on the Internet is starting to pass the number of humans on the face of the Earth. So ICANS comes around in 1998. And then, obviously, 2001 is the infamous uh, bubble bursting. But what's really interesting here, too, is that we see the birth of internet worms. So you have code, code, one, uh, code red one, code red two, and NIMBA. And they basically debilitize the internet. They bring it down. It's kind of the first time that this has happened, where people are exploiting things on the internet. So t 2007, what we can say, the iPhone, it arrives and it changes everything. Um, Android comes shortly after, obviously, um, uh, um, what's the other one? Uh, no, no, Blackberry, sorry. <laughs> they were around, but they failed. <laughs> sad statement, right? They, they failed to really kind of take off and make, make it into a real device like iPhone did. So it became a consumer product, right? They were able to take this thing, this connected device, a connected person, and turn it into a consumer product. 2010 is another very important time in the development, which is the development of Bluetooth LE, where it actually enters the Bluetooth standard. Bluetooth LE is on every single uh, mobile device out there. 1.5 billion devices in the world have Bluetooth LE or have Bluetooth on them. So this is another important thing: is the uh, as we add, bring this into the consumer world, you know, what survives is what's available to the consumer. So we start to look at the future, um, and like I said, in 2014, 61.5% of the traffic becomes non-human. Um, some very interesting numbers, it's projected that by 2017, there'll be 90 million people living in smart homes. Uh, by 2018, 250 million connected cars, and that gets us to 200, uh, 2020, which is about 50 billion connected devices, 8 billion people and one billion sites. So 59 billion things is kind of a large number. So <laughs> that's kind of the brief history that I wa wanted to go through. So some fun facts. This is facts for today. You have 80% of doctors are using mobile devices today that are now starting to use them to do remote monitoring of patients. So nearly 60% of all consumers use their smartphones to shop now. Right? And then this is also kind of awesome. 80 things per second are connecting to the internet today. That's, that number is from Cisco. They're projecting it out to be, I think, 150 things per second over the next few years. So we're talking a lot of things connecting to the internet. So I kind of wanted to then talk about real quick before we kind of get into the challenges of building a platform for the internet of things to kind of talk about, well, what is the internet of things? Right? Once you start to get through the hype, 
you start to realize it's the connected home. It was one of the, uh, was one of the more obvious, and it's actually more, one of the more present things that we're actually uh, seeing today. What's interesting is in the connected home, by 2017, there's going to be 800 million smart TVs that are going to be on the internet. So that's, that's, kind of, that's only uh, two years, three years away from us right now. What's interesting, as, as of the beginning of this year, Nest had uh, estimated 250,000 smart thermostats that they had shipped. And that was enough for Google to spend $3.2 billion to acquire them. So impressive numbers. So what is really the connected home, right? The connected home is a smart home. And you see it everywhere, and people are rushing. We actually talk to a lot of device manufacturers um, There's uh, here in the Bay Area. And Nest has caused this, this rush where everybody is trying to connect anything in the home, right? The connected toothbrush, the connected coffee maker, the connected refrigerator. So people are actually rushing out there, and the device manufacturers that we're talking to are actually working with some of these startups, like, how do you connect your coffee pot? So the connected home really is a vast collection of sensors and devices. Right? And so what's really interesting is when you start to look at how do I connect a home, it's all going to need to leverage the in-home Wi-Fi. Right? So I, how do I connect my uh, refrigerator to my TV to my curtains? And how do I know that the curtains should be drawn automatically? So there's actually a very interesting technology out there called AllJoin. It's by Qualcomm. It's a peer-to-peer -peer technology that's designed to allow interconnectivity between these household devices. So if, if you're looking at building some of these uh, in-home connected uh, things that need to talk to Samsung, you should probably be looking at AllJoin. So AllJoin, or Qualcomm moved AllJoin into uh, the open source world under the Linux Foundation just this last year. <laughs> and uh, they now have the backing of like Samsung, LG, and several of these other uh, uh, um, appliance manufacturers that they're starting to look at putting in this peer-to-peer technology so that the appliances can talk to each other. So one of the challenges, though, with AllJoin is it still doesn't add, answer the question of how do I cloud connect this local network, right? It also doesn't answer, or it doesn't really deal with the challenge of there's a lot of sensors, like motion sensors, heat sensors, uh, that don't have the ability to have a full stack. So I can't run the AllJoin daemon on it, or daemon on it. So I, there's still a lot of issues out there of how do I start to take these emerging technologies, assemble them into a nice cloud uh, solution for the connected home. So we move from the connected home into the connected city. And this is where things really start to get interesting. So um, with the connected city, we can start to look at opportunities within the city to, to create mesh networks. One of the upcoming opportunities is, is streetlights. So, Street lights can then be converted to using LED, um, put sensors on them, start to look at creating mesh networks across the street lights. What, th what this does is, while this is low energy, it's also low bandwidth. So you're not going to be using this mesh for obviously watching, streaming your television, along with every other inhabitant in the city. But you can be using this mesh for having your car talk to the parking meter underneath the street light. You can be using this mesh with the sensors to detect whether or not people are nearby and I need to brighten up the light or dim down the lights. So the other interesting component is the connected car, right? So Honda has already got an app store in the makings. They're embedding uh, Android devices as their, their console. And you can actually go on and download apps for your car. So it's kind of getting kind of awesome there. Um, I don't think a lot of people are aware that there are now app stores for their cars, but it's becoming more and more prevalent. Um, so when you start to look at connected cars, well, how do you deal with the cars connecting to the things around them? Like a car pulls into a parking spot and connects with the parking meter. Um, this information needs to, we need to solve how to aggregate this information in real time, providing low latency. And what this does is when you do solve this, you create opportunities where the city can offer routing alternatives. So the city becomes aware of congestion, where cars are as they report to the city their surroundings. Um, so it takes ways one step further, right, where the car itself is actually talking about the stuff. And it allows the city to start offering uh, routing alternatives, to start uh, 
optimize traffic patterns. So we kind of like look at 2018, and as I said, by 2018 there's estimated to be 250 million connected cars on the road. And there's a lot of articles that I won't necessarily dig down what that means, where the car talks to the car in front of it so that they don't crash, right? So there's some really exciting opportunities that are happening there. One really interesting piece of, uh, or fact, which is um, the BBC is reporting that as early as 2016, uh, Britain runs the risk of running out of generating electrical generation capacity. That's, that's a pretty scary uh, point in time for Britain. They're currently operating at 14% spare capacity, and they're believed over the next three years to be down to as low as 4%. By, with, the, with the worsening winters that Britain's encountering, they're looking at rolling blackouts and rolling brownouts. So the British Isle no longer has the ability to add more electrical capacity. So this is a really serious problem. So how do you solve this problem? Well, the connected city is the solution. So I start to outfit the city with, with modern equipment from lights to all sorts of devices where I can now start using low energy, low power. I can have lights turn off if there's no movement around. I can have them turn on when there are people nearby me. So the other important thing is as we look at the connected world and the connected city is how this connects to the power grid, right? So utilities. Utilities would like to be connected to the connected home for many reasons because utilities now are struggling with meeting power demands. Smart grids coordinate the needs and capacity of generators, operators, and users. But as we all know, even living here in California, sometimes those are brownouts. So how do you deal with situations? Well, with a connected home that's not only connecting to the home but all the electrical appliances, you can now feed back information to the homeowner to say, well, maybe you don't really want to uh, have that load of laundry going right now, right? Because it's at peak time, you're going to be paying peak uh, dollars for that energy. So being able to take the information coming and feed it back into the user, or into the home, to change their behavior is another key element of the Internet of Things. So we kind of move forward from the connected city to the connected industry. And this is kind of an awesome little uh, factoid, which is uh, there's a Dutch company called uh, Sparked that has created uh, implants for connected cows. <laughs> so they actually have uh, herds of cattle that have implants, and these implants are actually monitoring vital signs of the cattle, and uh, the data is being transmitted to a server so that farmers can see the health of their stock, whether or not they're pregnant, whether or not the environment is affecting them negatively, where they are, all sorts of really cool information. So we are now dealing with the connected farm, the connected cattle. So another really important connected industry, which is asset tracking of goods on the move. So there are 1.2 million trucking companies operating 15.5 uh, million trucks on the road. But more importantly, having insight into where everything is at all times is a problem. So one of our, one of our uh, Fortune 500 companies that we're working with, so they have 15,000 vehicles out there going to different job sites, needing to carry different types of equipment. They have no insight into where anything is. The current fleet management software doesn't really work. The current, current uh, ERP solutions don't really work because they don't give you real-time insight. They don't give you real-time location of everything. So now, with, as we move into the connected internet and the internet of things, you have a driver who has an app on their phone. They get into the cab of the truck. The truck has an industrial GPS unit that's using UDP to talk over the Sprint network to the cloud. We now know that the right driver is in the right truck. Right? The truck pulls up to a tractor or a trailer, and that trailer has a Bluetooth LE sensor on it. So now the driver pairs with, or the truck pairs with the trailer, we now know that the right truck is with the right, uh, the right drivers in the right truck with the right trailer. Now all of the heavy equipment, you know, $15,000 equipment has a $15 uh, Bluetooth LE sensor. We now know that all the right equipment's on the right truck with the right driver. And now 15 trucks are being dispatched to a job site. We now know that all 15 trucks have all the right things going to the job site. So asset tracking, Seeing how assets are performing out in the real world is a huge, huge opportunities and also a huge challenge. Uh, in part, too, also because many of the assets uh, 
are not cloud connected. So another interesting is a uh, single in, in, uh, intelligent en engine generates uh, one terabyte of data in a five hour flight. How do you get that into the cloud when it's flying over the clouds? <laughs> right? So that's, that's an interesting uh, little thing. So <laughs> there are a ton more use cases out there, right? Obviously the machine to machine, machine to infrastructure, uh, connected to vents is a huge, huge area. The mobile infantry, right? That's a huge opportunity. Connected schools, also huge opportunities, especially when the schools extend out to third world or developing nations, right? Um, so uh, before I, uh, I get kind of into, again, the, how we're gonna build it, one of the things I took pause on as I read a lot of these articles on what exactly is the Internet of Things, um, you see that there's a lot of people rushing into it. And uh, this is actually from Forrester. So they did a survey of, a lot of enterprises and they basically asked them, when are you most likely to implement the Internet of Things solution? Well, nobody really knows what the Internet of Things really is. There's a lot of different discussions, so how can you really be asking this question? And you find that people say, well, we already have an IoT solution. And 15% of them believe they have an Internet of Things solution. In the next 12 months, 28% believe that they're going to have it. So I would actually argue that perhaps they don't quite understand what the Internet of Things really means. And they probably just have a nice little solution for connecting their mobile phones, right, maybe. So, um, so let's start getting into what I need to do to build a platform that scales, a platform that can handle connecting not just one, not just a thousand, not just a hundred thousand, but a hundred million things, right, let alone 59 billion of them, right? So uh, the first thing is I need to have my devices or things, they need to be able to discover each other, right? So one of the challenges is that we look out and in the 2010 architecture, you know the address of the thing that you need to talk to, right? If you look at some of the M2M solutions out there, they have to figure out how to provision or onboard their inventory of devices based on either a MAC address or an IME, IMEI, some kind of you know, notable thing. Well, 59 billion things out in the world, you're not gonna onboard them into an address book. So how do I discover things? Also, how do I then communicate with each other? Another big problem. And then device data. So device data needs to be collected. And the key thing is how do I keep it synchronized, right? So if I have 10 or 15 things that are working in concert to do something, how do I make sure that they're staying synchronized? And then within the cloud, uh, we, need, we need to look out and we have to say, okay, we'll need to build actors, right? And these actors in the cloud will need to operate on the data that's coming in through all of these devices and start to take this in and give us operational and situational insight. Basically, turn this vast wealth of information coming in into insight, right? Because it really doesn't do any good to have 59 uh, uh, billion things feeding in information. There's actually a number that where I've read where um, I believe by 2016, uh, the amount of M2M data uh, coming in to the internet is expected to be around 562 petabytes per month. So that's a lot of data coming in, big data, right? How do you turn big data into actionable stuff? All right, so here's where we start to kind of get interesting in what, would, what are some of the technologies and protocols that we need to be looking at when we want to build one of these platforms. So the first one and foremost is Bluetooth LE. So Bluetooth LE, like I said, is on 1.5 million devices out in the world. Another uh, uh, protocol, which is Zigbee. Zigbee is based upon the 802.15 uh, standard. It's a mesh, low energy Wi-Fi uh, standard, but nothing supports Zigbee. You know, my iPhone doesn't have Zigbee. My Android doesn't have Zigbee. So it's a problem. You're just you're excluding 1.5 billion sensors already out in the world that could be talking to something with Zigbee. DDS, so DDS is actually a defense grade protocol. It's extremely fast. It's really ideally suited for device to device. So when we start to look at this kind of uh, slide, we can kind of break it up into protocols that need to deal with device to device conversation, protocols that need to deal with device to cloud, and then protocols that need to deal with server to server within the cloud. So MQTT, a good protocol to be looking into if you're building this stuff 
for a device to cloud. Uh, XMPP is another good one, although latency on XMPP is around one second or more. So you have to kind of be looking into, do you want to have ultra low latencies or do you want to have, you know, is one second okay? Um, from the server, uh, cloud to cloud, or server to server, AMQP is obviously a protocol that you want to be investigating. And this is actually what's, what's on here that's not like the others, protocol buffers. So uh, I didn't really have any place to put this, so I put it here. Um, protocol buffers, if you're not using them, you should. If you don't love them, you need to. So um, <laughs> protocol buffers are basically, they're developed by Google, and I know there are some competing standards out there, but uh, it's a way of encoding structured data in a very efficient and flex flexible manner and it basically condenses it down to a wire type that is very efficient. So you have variable ints, you have, uh, uh, as long as you kind of follow the good practice of protocol buffers, extremely extens extensible. Um, and it's the way to be talking from devices to the server and inter in interoperability between the server. So protocol buffers, can't say enough about them. <laughs> so, what are the real challenges of building the Internet of Things? So, kind of getting into the meat of things. So, one of the first things is identity. So, this is a serious problem, and you never really see any discussion of this. So, devices are not people. Even though I'm a person using my iPhone, it's, this is not a person. And as we found from the statistic of 61.5% non-human traffic, people aren't always people either. So how do you identify things? Uh, today there are 1.5 billion smart devices in the world, and over the course of the last two releases of their OS, Apple, Android's following, uh, Windows, have made it impossible to uniquely identify these devices. Right? They've cre it's created a huge headache for ad, pe ad people. Right? There is some support, but it doesn't survive the phone. How do I, I need to be able to survive identity, identifying the phone if I really want to create a reasonable fabric where I have 59 billion things. Because otherwise, this thing could present itself a thousand times. If I have 59 billion things presenting themselves a thousand times, I have a very unwieldy problem. So, so this, is, this is really a problem, right? And we face it every day. We, you know, you can have the server generate a unique ID, send it to the device. But what if whatever that device changes? What if I reset the device? Right? I need something that's stable and survives it. So the next big challenge is discovery. So right now, I have an address book of my friends. I send them a text message or an email, and I invite them to join something I'm doing. Sure, I know them. Well, the reality is, is as I get 50 billion things out in the world, I'm not going to have an address book of 50 billion things. I mean, it's just not really feasible. It's not really possible. So the world of tomorrow is really about discovering, discovering what's nearby me, discovering what's around me. So uh, this means mesh or some sort of fine-grained proximity detection. So, and there's actually a lot of work being done on the proximity detection using a variety of technologies. Um, so this also brings into what about privacy? Right? And then, obviously, you have a conflicting thing of how do I discover things while maintaining privacy? you know, the previous slide of identity. So the last thing is the best part is what about security? Have you ever thought that you'd ask yourselves, can I trust that light pole? Right, I mean, and that's really what we're facing with. As I have a city and I have every light pole every 20 feet that's cloud connected enabled, can I trust it? Can I trust the parking meter? It also introduces amazing problems. Can you imagine a botnet attack where you actually employ every single parking meter in the city to attack a site? I mean, there are some awesome challenges that we're facing. How, you know, what happens if I have a denial of service attack against that parking meter because I don't want to pay my parking fines, <laughs> right? So, so there's a lot of challenges that nobody has talked about. Nobody has really even touched upon. Uh, and so you, so you look at the peer-to-peer -peer model and you say, okay, well, we can do advertising, right? Well, how do I advertise what I need or what I'm looking for to 50 billion other things in real time? How do I find them? Right? Because the internet is really a single giant blob. There's no, there's no, you know, it's around the other side of the globe, right? It's all in the same space at the same time, right? There's no distance, there's no proximity. So the other challenge is connecting. 
So how do I connect things together? Things are not created equal. So first we have uh, wearable sensors, um, and I brought one to, to show you. This is a nice little wearable sensor that we work with one of our partners. It gives you, it's an accelerometer, gyroscope, a magnetometer, very, a lot of amazing information coming in off of this little tiny thing, right? These things are down, you can get them down to about $50 in mass production. So if you're starting to look at building some sort of wearable, right, you can, you can actually do, you can do an end run from design through production, retail ready for about $75, depending, and you can get it down. Problem is, how do you cloud connect this, right? Why would I want to cloud connect a wearable? Well, I could take this wearable that gives me force, acceleration, it gives me location, uh, uh, direction. I can put these on my football team, right? So I have these things on my football team. I now can see them out on the field, right, because I can get proximity location from the Bluetooth information coming off of this. And now I can feed this back through the cloud to the coach. He has an iPad, he's looking at his players. I now have a history of every time a player has executed that play on the field. They go to execute that play. I'm now the, able to correlate that in real time, watch all of these players and these team members on the field as they execute each play. I can then see that my linebacker isn't doing a very good job. They're not performing like they've done every single time uh, that they've done prior. So as the coach, I can then change up my plays because I know I have a weakness with my linebacker. This thing makes it possible. Cloud connecting this makes that possible. So little, little wearable sensors. So, uh, and on top of that, you know, this is Bluetooth. This is Bluetooth. So who wins? Bluetooth wins, right? So uh, what does this mean? Well, I need a proxy, right? This is not, there's no way you can cloud connect this, right? Putting Wi-Fi on this would be just, you'd need a battery like this big, right? So, so it doesn't work. So it needs a proxy to something that can work, right? So how do you solve those problems? Um, and then another one is that the world is still filled with devices from, uh, from tw uh, 2001 to 2010 that are actually network attached. There's, we're working with these vendors, two vendors that produce uh, two of the major GPS tr uh, industrial units for trucks, right? They speak UDP, they're cloud connected, but they're dumb, right? How do I actually turn these into first class citizens that live in the cloud that can then do something, right? And then smart devices obviously are first class citizens. So the next challenge is uh, co collecting, uh, collaborating, and communicating. So these things run out of battery very fast, right? So if I'm using a, mo a cellular network, which a lot of devices will be using more and more, like cars driving down the road, um, or people working, you know, uh, my, my force, or my uh, field service agents out in the field using a device like this, I need to deal with the fact of the battery. How do I keep the battery from running down? Cellular networks are fragile, right? You have this promise of always connected. The reality is always trying to connect. If you ever were to look at the actual output from your device, you would see that you're disconnecting, you know, you could be dis disconnecting for 250 milliseconds every 500 milliseconds, right? This makes it really challenging to have stable communication. So these are all challenges that you have to deal with. And then when you have a variety of classes of devices that need to group together to get out and do something, how do you deal with synchronizing, right? This is a very advanced device. This is not, or excuse me, the uh, GPS unit. There's no way I can store information onto it, right? So these are all some challenging problems. And more important is not all devices can afford TCP IP, right? So the company that we're working with, uh, they have a data plan with Sprint, 15,000 trucks. Each truck is only allowed one megabyte of data per month. How do you create a sensor network with that? Right? It's very hard. So people kind of pontificate about this always connected world, but the reality is it's not always affordable right now. Right? I have to deal with one megabyte per month or two megabytes per month. I have to deal with UDP. So <laughs> continuing on, then how do, I deal, how do I take advantage of this information and analyze, visualize, and operate on it? Right? So I have all this information coming in from all these devices. So what? Right? I need to be able to take it in and do something with it. Right? So this is known as situational awareness to situational intelligence. 
and ultimately situational optimization. It's where I take this information from the things around me and I'm able to start to make decisions on what's going on, right? Building intelligent systems. And then ultimately be able to optimize the behavior where I take this information coming in, I'm running analytics and predictive models, and I'm able to then push the information back out to the device. So I have 59 billion things out in the world, how do I make sure that piece of information routes back to that one device to tell it, oh, throttle down your engine, or you know, you're off track, or change your behavior, right? So these are some of the big problems <coughs> of building the Internet of Things. So um, obviously we'll get to the main crux, which is why Erlang? So the Internet of Things is, as you probably already all know, is fundamentally a network routing problem. Right? How, do I, how do I connect and route between all of these smart things? Uh, it's also not all network attached things are smart. How do I turn them into first class citizens? Um, and how do I then deal with things that are proxying through another device, right? And the uh, monolithic enterprise block architecture is dead, long lived distributed uh, lightweight processes. So what do I mean by this? So you've probably seen this picture a million times over. This is kind of your traditional J2E stack, right? It's, it's great if you have 50,000 employees. Right? Yeah. Um, it's not so great if you have 50 million. It's not so great if you have 50 billion. Right? So you have an OS, your database, relational database, your PHP, Perl, Apache, your JBoss container. How do I scale this overnight when I have 100,000 people today and 1 million people tomorrow? Good example, WhatsApp. We all know WhatsApp, right? So, they have 450 million users. They're running on a, a very advanced kind of modified eJabber uh, uh, architecture. 32 engineers supporting 450 million users, scaling overnight by millions at a time. Right? I need a technology that's going to do this. This doesn't do this. Right? Not only this, this is a very monolithic approach. I have a monolith that is my message broker. I have a monolith that's my database. I have a monolith that's uh, you know, my JBoss container. So what does the IoT stack really look like? Well, it's an Erlang, and you have one box, which is your IoT platform, and then your persistence, right? Because you obviously need to persist your messages. So we're talking a message queue architecture, but we're talking one that's built in Erlang. So we use React. React is awesome. If you haven't used it, you should look into it. Um, React is a distributed, uh, low latency, uh, NoSQL database. It's operationally very simple to use. Our technology is actually uses uh, React Core um, to achieve its uh, distribution. But fundamentally, your IoT platform will have protocol codecs, right? I need to support the Moray uh, uh, um, GPS industrial unit. I need to support CalAMP GPS industrial unit. I need to support HTTP. I need to support UDP. So I have all these different products, uh, pro protocols and codecs that I need to roll in. And so I need to have these codecs kind of living agents. How do I turn that GPS, industrial GPS unit into something that can do something? Well, I do that by creating an agent that then takes on the behavior of the GPS unit and then turns that GPS unit into a first class citizen. I could text with it, I can text with my dog. An agent with a dog collar can turn the dog into a first class citizen, right? So services, how do I implement services in the cloud when I have a distributed architecture? Services like maybe I wanna do chat, maybe I wanna do location aware stuff, maybe I wanna do task management. So when we kinda look at Erlang, it's process based. I love Erlang, I love the process based model. Right? Why? Because everything is a process. Right? And the Erlang excels when it's short-lived processes. Right? You want to get away from this mentality of this old J2E stack of like creating these long-running things that just kind of eat up memory and become sad. Right? What I really want to do is I want to have a process spin up, deal with what needs to be d done, and then goes away. Right? Erlang just excels at this, this type of so I have protocol processes, I have agent processes, and I have service processes all living in my node, right? You can start to see from this picture that things are very homogenized. There's nothing specialized anywhere here, right? So 
I kind of come out and my cluster's basically a cluster of nodes, which is a cluster of processes running. My node goes down, those processes simply re relocate to different nodes in the, in the cluster, right? Erlang makes this possible. And it's important to approach these distributed problems, if you can, in a fine-grained process-oriented manner, right? If you're trying to create something that has to spin, span nodes, I would argue that may, or su suggest that maybe you should rethink what you're doing, right? I would try to look at taking and leveraging Erlang's architecture so that I actually have fine-grained things running in the node. And then I just have more nodes, more processes to deal with the load. So this is your architecture in Erlang. This is your stack, right? Whether the node is a IoT platform node or a React node, right? I have a React cluster of n number of nodes, an IoT platform of n number of nodes. I need more capacity, I add another node. It's all that happens. So Erlang, uh, why Erlang? Um, I, hopefully I kind of started covering this and uh, maybe some of you already knew all this or maybe some, you got some insight. Um, the other interesting thing is, is that Erlang is really, really excellent at uh, doing binary, uh, the bit string syntax and pattern matching. So implementing protocols, your pro pro supporting a variety of protocols in Erlang is dead simple. It's, it's actually I would call it trivial, right? <laughs> um, and do, dealing with the interchange of binary data is, 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 a very, is a strength of Erlang. The other thing about Erlang, and when you start to look at the agents, is that not all of these connected devices can actually run computationally complex operations. So sure, this is a very advanced device, but maybe there's a, some function that this thing will collect the data, send it to the cloud, let the cloud do it, and then send back the results. This holds true with a variety of devices. You can have an Arduino board, or you can have a, a, a BeagleBone board, or any of these things that have enough processing capacity to be a first class citizen, but not enough processing capacity to actually do something with it. So Erlang allows you to, to leverage putting services in the cloud that moves the logic into the cloud. So uh, in closing, and then we'll, I'll just uh, take some questions afterwards, I kind of wanted to show you an example codec. So this is a codec that we use to support a device uh, by a company called More. So they have an uh, industrial uh, GPS units that fit in trucks all over the world. Um, and it's 150 lines, that's all it took. It took just a couple of hours to write. Um, and you can see it's a little blurry, but the main processing is just simply a uh, bit syntax pattern matching. Erlang just, it just is a wonderful, wonderful technology for doing this. Now, Moray happens to support very much like a protocol buffer where it's self-describing messages, which is really great for Erlang. So here you see, basically, you just have an, an iteration where I cross each, each uh, parse element, and now I've transformed the protocol, the message coming from this GPS unit into something I can do with. Right? And then the encoder, Right, so you can't have a decoder without an encoder, so I can talk back to the unit. 150 lines. This, you'd never be able to do this with Java, right? Java would be probably like 10 times this. So I used to do Java, <laughs> so I've <laughs> since drank the Erlang Kool-Aid. So uh, this is the Internet of Things. I, uh, I hope I gave you some interesting information, um, the challenges that we face, and these are actually very real challenges, and the challenges that are out there. So. Um, with that said, uh, I'd like to thank you and uh, take any questions you might have. So. Thank you. Um, uh, yes. Yes, it'll be public. Uh, back there. Uh, I'm sorry? Okay. So you wanted to know a little bit about uh, how humans are involved in with dependable systems and letting it crash? Yes, I mean, to okay. Extent, well, well, so you, I would actually argue that you do want it to crash. So, so the idea of like having um, 
uh, for example, uh, trucks uh, getting information. You don't want to be doing exception uh, processing. You want it, the information. You want it to crash and restart as fast as possible. So Erlang has a supervisor, you know, model. So as the individual processes start to crash, right, you want that to be handled quickly and restarted. Another great thing that I failed to talk about was Erlang's hot upgrade. So, um, so this actually allows you to deal with faulting systems and upgrade them in real time without actually turning off the system. And there's actually a demo, uh, Francesco has talked about it, which is that uh, there's a group that's done a quadcopter, right? And so they actually have Erlang embedded on the quadcopter. You've seen you know, these little, little toy quadcopters. <laughs> and they have this one where it's got a bug in it and the quadcopter is kind of you know, doing this. Imagine if you're actually in it. You know? And what they do is they do a hot uh, code upload into the quadcopter and you can see it doing this kind of thing and suddenly it's fixed and it's flying straight. So letting it crash, letting it fail is actually a very important paradigm in building real-time distributed systems. You just don't want to let it fail so it fails and doesn't do anything else, obviously, and that's obviously a logic problem. But failing fast and then restarting and then also uh, hot, you know, being able to uh, do a hot code upgrade, those are very key to real-time systems. Yes, yes. And I'm not necessarily talking about like the truck itself being a uh, embedded Erlang. So part of this conversation was how do I connect the embedded system to the internet? So that would be another different discussion, which I am not. Um, let me get over here. Uh, that's a challenge, and really our approach is not to try to convince them. Our approach is to, to solve how to, how to adapt, you know, create a proxy to adapt that whatever their protocol is into something a little bit more consumable. And that's what our, our codec does. And so the consumer of that codec code transforms it into a protocol buffer. So it comes to the edge of the cloud, right? We don't, we're not in a position, right now we're a small company, to go and tell everybody to change their hardware that they've been building now for the last 15, 20 years. You know. So what we do is instead is we wait till it hits the edge of the cloud, and then that's when we take the opportunity, we parse it, we, we, transform, we encode the information, and then we transform it into a protocol buffer, and then it's shipped around the cloud in, as a protocol buffer. So, uh, you had a question. That's very true. So that's the other aspect about Erlang, is that when there's a crash, if the system itself is crashing as a whole, right, you have a, a bigger problem um, with the embedded system itself. But if, for example, uh, the GPS component of it's crashing, uh, the other processes are, are alive and running, right? So, so it's decoupled, right, it's isolated. And so that is very key in building uh, Erlang systems. And we see that all the time in our system where even we'll have a message queue crash. And there's only 10 things on that message queue, but all 10,000 other queues are operating. Nobody else notices anything. So that's why you get back to the fine-grained process actor model, right? So that thing dies, that's the only thing affected. Thank you.